I'm Megan Jones. And I'm Jennifer Lucassi. And we work in the education department at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum in New York City. Today, we're recording inside the museum, which sits in the architectural footprint of where the original Twin Towers once stood in Lower Manhattan. Located 70 feet below ground, this 110,000-square-foot museum contains artifacts, both large and small, that tell thousands of stories of survival, heroism, and the ongoing legacy of 9-11. Millions of people have visited the site since the opening of both the memorial in 2011 and the museum in 2014, many of them too young to remember the attacks. So how do we impart the significance of 9-11 for a generation with no living memory of it, while also underscoring its ongoing relevance today? That is the driving force behind one of our central goals— to support teachers as they tackle this complicated and challenging content in the classroom. So Jen, as the manager of our teacher programs, what do you think's been the most effective way to determine the type of support that teachers need? Well, Megan, that's a really good question. Um, And I think the best way to find out how to support somebody is to go straight to the source and ask. So as you know, we begin every teacher PD an event by asking the same question. What are the biggest challenges that you face when you're teaching 9-11 or even thinking about teaching 9-11? And the results are always really, really interesting. Uh, So we do see a couple things come up over and over again, right? We have some key challenges. One is the emotionality of the content. Sometimes teachers are worried about the emotionality for their students, but also really the emotionality for themselves. Um, You know, every teacher likely has a living memory of this event. So how do you teach something that that doesn't feel that way to you? Um, Another is fitting it into the curriculum. I mean, we know every teacher has, it's always feels as if you have too much to do. You can't possibly fit everything into a single school year. Um, And the one that I think we hear over and over again that we're really going to zero in on today is this divide, right, between history, where students think 9-11 is something that happened Yes, yeah, so long ago, right? Long, long ago, <laughs> right? And um, even though, you know, it's only 16 years coming up on the 16th anniversary. And the idea and this divide between memory where teachers are like, but this is something I experienced. This is very real and raw to me. Um, and it can be really jarring when your students don't have that connection. Um, so we don't just brainstorm these challenges. I mean, you know this, of course, uh, but we we really try to come up with strategies to help teachers confront these challenges head on. Um, And one, one of my favorite ones, um, and I know you like this one too, is, um, and it especially works well for elementary and middle school. It can work for all ages, but really for elementary and middle using personal stories to ground the narrative so that it's not just on September 11th, 2,977 people were killed. That's an important fact, but it's, you know, it's very abstract. Um, So I think, uh, and I'm going to sort of talk from the experience of teaching here. Um, What do we mean by personal stories, right? So you mentioned uh, that we have artifacts large and small that tell these stories. And one of my favorite artifacts is one that um, students are often surprised is in a museum. It's a little red bandana. You know, you ask a student what they use it for. They might say fashion statement. A lot of them have actually said, oh, I love I love putting those on my dog. He looks really cute. Or construction, um, keeping sweat out of your face, those kinds of things. Exactly. Right. All of these really mundane, everyday things. Um, but that red bandana, um, they discover through questioning and inquiry, connects the story of this amazing young man named Wells Crowther, who has become known as the man in the red bandana, who is credited with saving at least a dozen people on 9-11. On 9-11, he turns that bandana into a life-saving tool in that he covers his his own mouth and nose with it um, so that he can breathe. And he then assists people evacuating the South Tower. He finds the stairwell, the safe stairwell that people can go down to get out of the building. And he directs people down that stairwell and goes back up, directs more people down that stairwell and goes back up. 
and continues until the collapse of the South Tower, going down those stairs and going back up. Mm. Um, so all of a sudden, this little abstract piece of fabric represents wells. Uh, and there's a, a really uh, fantastic aha moment in the museum. So we have this beautiful installation. Um, it's a work by Spencer Finch called Trying to Remember the Color of the Sky That September Morning. And it has 2,983 individual watercolor tiles. Now, all the tiles are the same size and shape, but each one is a unique shade of blue. Um, and of course, the number's no accident. It's the number of victims from 9-11 and the 1993 bombing as well. Um, and at first, students look at it and they see a lot of blue squares. But I love the light bulb moment when they make this connection that one of those squares is Wells. And they then make this second connection that only one of those squares is Wells. That's one story. And every single person on that wall has a story. Um, and that, to me, is one of the most powerful ways to take this um, and take something that is essentially abstract and long ago <laughs> for students mm -hmm. and, and make it personal. Um, but I, I know that um, I'd love sort of to pick your brain and talk about how we sort of make this real for our high school students because they do tend to, you know, they're very interested in connecting to mm -hmm. themselves and their own experience. Um, so, Megan, what do you think for our older students? What, uh, what strategies sort of would you recommend for teachers trying to make this connection with high school students? Absolutely. It's an important question because we're coming upon a generation of students who, again, have no living memory or are too young to remember if they're in high school. And thinking back to my days as a high school uh, social studies teacher, I remember always thinking at the beginning of the year and before starting any unit, it's about making a connection to the students. So in other words, helping them to see why it's important to learn history and why it matters. But rather than telling them why it matters, I think the important part is to give them opportunities to make that discovery on their own. So I think that's the strategy that really works well when you're talking about high school students. Um, and I think the best example of that is talking to them about the repercussions of 9-11 or how the world has changed. So how, how do they understand that what happened, as you mentioned 16 years ago, we say only 16 years, they think, wow, 16 years, that's so long ago. <laughs> uh, um, you know, helping them to see that the world that they're going to soon inherit has been forever affected and changed based on what happened 16 years ago. And the best way to do that is, um, as I said, giving them the opportunities. And one opportunity that stands out in my mind is connected to the new exhibition cover stories, um, remembering the Twin Towers on The New Yorker. And it features 33 covers of the New Yorker magazine from many different time periods. So from the point where the towers were first being constructed to, of course, 9-11, um, you know, the post 9-11 time in terms of both repercussions, but also rebuilding of the site and what exists today. And um, I piloted a lesson connected to one cover that's entitled Holiday Travel. And this cover features Santa Claus. And he is in a very uncomfortable situation. And I say that because when you look at him, he looks nervous, he's sweating, and there's people around him looking at him with sort of either shock or suspicion. And his bag of toys is being sent through a scanner by a very serious looking security figure. And when I show this cover to a group of high school students, I start with very basic questions. Um, you know, who do you notice? And of course, they say Santa. And say, well, what's happening to him? They say he's he's being searched. That's so strange. Why would Santa be searched? And it ultimately resulted in a conversation about how, in the days immediately following 9/11, people were afraid, and they wanted to feel safe. And the point was that even Santa can't be trusted. But something else interesting happened during that activity. When I asked them, where do you think Santa is? To me, it was a, it was a easy question. Yeah, I mean, for me, I saw the metal detector. I see the x-ray machine. 
Yeah, I immediately think immediately think airport. And um, so when I asked them where do you think Santa is, there was a sort of a, an uncomfortable silence. And it went on for a few seconds, and finally one of the students sort of sheepishly raised her hand and said, the airport? But more as a question than a statement. And that was a a light bulb moment for me because it made me realize again that they only know a post-9-11 world. So seeing metal detectors is nothing unusual. It's not necessarily associated with an airport anymore. Um... For many of them, they encounter that at multiple points in their day, whether it's going into a school building or even coming into our museum. It's very much like airport security. So um, I think, you know, based on that experience, we got into a really interesting conversation about the balance between civil liberties and national security. And um, we were able to make connections to today, the we're still having the, that conversation 16 years later, and we've also had that conversation at other points in history. This isn't the first time. So I think that's a really effective way to help students understand the significance of 9-11 by helping them to see why it's important to remember and how it is actually um, affecting their lives both today and um, in the future. So that was definitely also, I think, for us as staff members, though, a light bulb moment in terms of remembering that we have to set the context for what the world was like before 9-11. And I think, Jen, that the questions that we're, you know, we're addressing right now are very different than the ones we were thinking about even just three and a half years ago when the museum was opening. Um, And why do you think that is? Why do you think the questions have changed? Well, it, and it's interesting because there's sort of two prongs to this, right? The yeah, the questions we're thinking about behind the scenes have definitely shifted. I can, um, uh, you know, we were both working in the museum before it was open to students, and in that lead up, it's so funny. We were really, really conscious of not wanting to emotionally traumatize students. You know, how do we, um, how do we? have them in this space and talk honestly about 9-11 in a way that's age appropriate. Right. Without traumatizing them right. or, you know, scaring them. And then, of course, it very um, and now this seems so obvious to me. Right. Our, our immediately the perspective shifted. We started getting students in the building and they were OK. They um, and I like to think it's because we put a lot of thought into <laughs> our age appropriate questioning. But it's also because they don't have a living memory so they were walking in and and they weren't crying and they they weren't you know super upset but they were engaged they were so many questions um they asked anything and everything um the people that were really kind of struggling emotionally were actually our chaperones because to come into this space with children again when you have a living memory of the event is a big ask you know Mm -hmm. um so we sort of quickly realized that um, we were going to be okay with students, that we needed to be thoughtful about the way that we structure things for adults. Um, but since these students were asking a million questions a minute, um, it became, the focus shifted, right, to what kinds of questions are we um, hearing from students over and over again and how can we answer them because and i'm I'm sure you can attest to this too megan the questions that we get from students Mm -hmm. are not always very easy to answer and i think you make a an excellent point in terms of thinking about how the questions have changed both for staff members thinking about what do we think students will ask and what are we prepared to answer Versus the shift in, they are asking questions we couldn't even imagine, and we need to be prepared for those. So we were prepared to talk about, you know, who attacked us on 9-11 and why did they do that? And we were prepared to talk about how the world had changed in terms of obvious examples like airport security. But what do you do when you have young people asking, why am I hearing Uh, comments made towards my friends who are Muslim? Or why are people looking at me differently because I am Muslim? And those are the types of questions that we quickly realize now we need to be ready to answer. Right. And again, it's that um, interesting divide for students we see over and over again between understanding, and we see this a lot. We have, um, so we have this 
really wonderful ambassador program where we invite some of the best high school students. Of course, I'm biased, but (laughs) the most wonderful students into the museum for a year long internship. And many of the ambassadors um, are asking those questions in their application. Either they are Muslim themselves or they have friends and family who are Muslim. And they understand that Islamophobia was a repercussion of 9-11, you know, that it increased, but they can't wrap their heads around why it's still an issue today, 16 years in the future. Um, So to be prepared to help walk students through the connective tissue between an event that feels so far away for them Mm -hmm. um, to the present day, we have to be prepared to tackle that with students, which um, can be very daunting as an educator. These issues around identity can be so fraught and difficult to discuss. Exactly. And that's why when we were thinking about adding new educational resources for our website, it happened at the same time that Cover Stories was in development and we were able to find opportunities to create dialogue around these very sensitive subjects using the art from New Yorker covers, for example. And it's an opportunity to dip your toes in to a difficult conversation or expand it into a full day, week, or unit lesson, um, depending on the students that teachers are working with and their comfort level and where they are in their curriculum. But it's something that I think in the years to come, we will continue to expand upon because now that we've been open for several years now and we're able to talk to teachers both in our own professional development programs and also traveling around the country, as you said in the beginning, Jen, by asking teachers what they need and asking them what the challenges are, we're better prepared to give them that support um, based on those responses and our own personal experiences here in the museum. Um, I think we both recognize very clearly how hard this work is and how difficult this is for educators um, across the country. But the important thing, I think, as we've talked about this in the past, is that the questions that they're asking are difficult, but nonetheless, they are asking them, and we need to be prepared to answer them, because if we're not able to answer them, the students are going to go elsewhere for information, and there is a lot of bad or less than credible information out there for students to find. Um, So I think today we've given hopefully a couple of strategies based on our experience about how to bridge that divide between history and memory, both using personal stories and also helping students situate themselves within the narrative um, and also into current events today. But again, this is just the beginning. So we do have a variety of additional resources for tackling this difficult content, including lesson plans, professional development opportunities, uh, recordings of family members, survivors, and first responders sharing their own personal stories to hopefully support all of you out there um, as you continue this important work in the classroom. And um, as sort of a last um, offer, We'd love to say that if there are teachers out there, if you're listening to this and you feel like you have questions or you'd like some additional support, you can also reach out to us directly, our school program staff, at schoolprograms, all one word, at 911memorial.org. And if you send us a question there, we will do our very best to answer it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.